Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Louise Ivers, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Global Health at Massachusetts General Hospital. And we've been holding these Friday panels in the hope of um, exchanging between um, information we're gathering in Boston, where I'm located, and with our partners who work in various settings around the world. So we can try to have an exchange of some best practices and have questions and answers and discussion around how to manage the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in places with very low resources. Today, I'm really delighted that we have a great lineup of speakers and discussants. Um, we have with us Dr. Raj Punjabi, who's the co-founder and CEO of Last Mile Health. Um, Raj is also an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and part of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And we also have Andrea Liner with us. She's a nurse practitioner in emergency medicine and also the director of strategic planning for global response management, which is an international NGO working in many crisis areas around the world, including in Mexico and on the US border. We also have as a, a discussant, Dr. David Walton with us, uh, who's the uh, CEO and co-founder of Build Health International and also uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And uh, later this morning, we'll have Dr. Vanessa Carey also joining us, um, the CEO and uh, founder of Seed Global Health and a pulmonary and critical care doctor. So we're, the lineup will be first, uh, Andrea Liner will speak with us, uh, then we'll have some time for questions and answers, and then we'll pass on to Dr. Punjabi to speak. Um, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom line if you can to pose some questions to us and I'll be moderating those as we go. Uh, we're also very interested in knowing um, where our audience is. So if you can shoot a message to us in the Q&A or the chat where you are, this is going to be really helpful for us as we think about continuing these sessions. We hope they're useful. We'd love to hear more about that. So we don't waste your time. We want to make sure your time is being um, well used. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to um, Andrea. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you everybody. Um, and thank you to you, Louise, for putting this together because the information sharing is really key right now. So I work with Global Response Management. We are a veteran-led US-based uh, medical NGO. We specialize in high-risk, low-resource areas, <laughs> particularly for people who have been displaced by conflict or war. Um, over the last three years, we've operated in Iraq, in Yemen, Northeast Syria, Bangladesh, the Bahamas, and now Matamoros, Mexico. Okay, we can go to the next one. All right, a little bit of the overview of camp. So right across the bridge from Brownsville, Texas, there are about 2,000 to 2,500 people living in tents um, sandwiched between the Rio Grande River and the egress and entrance to the bridge road. Um, and it's a size of about two football pitches put together, a little muddy stretch of land. Um, about 15 or about half of our population is under the age of 15. We started a clinic there in September of 2019. Our clinic is right in the middle of camp. It's a mobile medical unit. We are open seven days per week, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we staff it with three providers, uh, three RNs or paramedics who do intake and triage. We have two pharmacists and three translators. On average, we see about 40 to 50 patients per day. Most of our complaints are upper respiratory illness, GI, and we also have OBGYN um, complaints. We have an OB on staff on Tuesdays and Fridays, and on, uh, on campus there, we can do ultrasound, we can do point of care testing, we can do electrolytes, you know, H&H, &H, that kind of stuff, and also EKGs. We stabilize and refer any emergencies to the public hospital, and we use an electronic medical record tracking system. Okay, we can go to the next one. So we started working on COVID about four to five weeks ago because we knew dealing with a population um, displaced, living in a stressful environment. As you can see, the tents are jammed close together. There's no possibility of quarantine or isolation or containment in this kind of situation. Um, so we wanted to be aggressive in our planning and we met down there about 10 days ago and implemented the system. We're focusing on three different things. We're focusing on prevention, fortification, and treatment. On the prevention side of things, we have a physician on the ground, Dr. Rojas, who you see there in the first photo. 
He's a critical care doctor for who's in a, himself and been in our clinic now for about six months full time. So he's leading the community education front and we're tapping into the micro communities that exist within camp. So there are groups that break down by six to seven tenths. They do communal cooking, they work together security wise uh, with their children, etc. And the camp also breaks down by country you're from. So we're tapping into those micro communities to take advantage of that culture to help us with the education piece. It's very important that people are seeing us as a resource for information and not getting it from social media and other places. Um, we also established a 24 hour hotline for anybody to call with questions or if they're sick, they can report their symptoms and we will send a medical provider to them to keep them from uh, traversing the camp with their symptoms. Some of the practical things we're talking about, try to put two meters in between each tent, not really possible, but we're encouraging it opening the ventilation flaps, um, mopping instead of sweeping the dust to prevent the spread. Also, we're encouraging people to sleep head to toe in their tents instead of um, all the heads across to try to decrease nocturnal transmission of the virus. Um, we're also asking the micro communities if somebody gets sick um, to have them stay in their tent and either send a runner or call our hotline and we will come to them. Um, we then bring them a kit which includes uh, surgical masks, we ask them to isolate there. They have um, some hand sanitizer. They have um, a little pulse ox that we send for them to take their vitals and text them in every day. And then we do daily checks. Um, one of the other things that we've done is we've increased the number of sinks in camp. We're also working on wash solutions uh, as well as the medical side of things. So we've increased the number of sinks uh, by about 40 this week. Um, on the fortification side, we recognize that if we can keep one person out of the hospital, that is a victory for us. So we've gone ahead and um, treated everybody in camp with multivitamins that contain vitamin D and zinc to boost their immune systems a little bit. And we're also asking people with high-risk conditions to identify themselves to us so we can evaluate their, their medication regimen and make sure that their baseline is as robust as possible. So whether that's evaluating the asthmatic and bumping them up on an inhaler, those are the kinds of things we're doing. On the treatment side of things, when we identify somebody who is possibly COVID, if they have mild to moderate symptoms, we are gonna ask them to isolate in their tents and their micro communities to kick in to help. We will do daily checks on them. Um, for moderate to severe illness, right now the plan is to send those people to the public hospital. When the public hospital becomes, uh, when it reaches capacity, we have permission from the government to build two uh, negative pressure tents that can hold 10 people each. So we will have the capacity to take care of about 20 people in a progressive care setting. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. So here's camp. Along the top, you can see the Rio Grande River and on the other side, it's the US. And then at the bottom, you can see the road and there's our camp sandwiched in between. The red and black cross in the middle is where our clinic is. And down on the right side of the slide is where we are gonna be setting up our field hospital with our hot, warm, and cold zones. It's about 150 meters from the south end of camp. Okay, we can go to the next one. This is a very pretty drawing of what our uh, field hospitals will look like. We have no water or power, so we are bringing in a water filtration system that will filter water from the Rio Grande. We have two other uh, of these systems in camp and they work really well. We're gonna be working uh, using generators and also um, some solar solutions look like they could be coming up for us. So we will have these two field hospitals with their own porta potties and wash stations there. We will have our decon area, which is gonna be a very uh, simple three bucket bleach solution system. We have a, uh, a staff lounge for lack of a better word with their own bathroom facilities, a storage container, and we also have a small ATV that will run supplies back and forth. Okay, we can go to the next one. This is just our incident command system that we're starting to put together and fill in as people uh, make commitments on their time and how we're gonna break things down. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. All right, so how we're staffing the clinic. Um, we're gonna have a day shift and a night shift. Uh, we're gonna work 12 hour shifts, five people per shift. Dr. Daidon Rojas, our critical care physician on the ground, will oversee both the clinic and the field hospital. And then on each team, we will have a physician, a mid-level provider, and um, three either RNs or paramedics that are specialized in combat medical or field experience. 
Um, we will also keep the clinic open all day um, from 10 to 4, and that's going to be staffed by two physicians, two RNs, pharmacists, translators who will back up the hospital needs. We've um, we've identified too in our population. Um, we also we have a lot of professionals in our population. Interestingly enough, mostly from Cuba. So we went ahead and did a camp survey and identified anybody who was uh, medical personnel, um, former military, or police to just kind of figure out where we could tap into uh, to uh, when our when our staff was spent um, and what resources we had. So we were able to identify physicians and RNs who are asylum seekers themselves, and they will be staffing the clinic mostly. We are also in the process of setting up a telehealth system that will give us direct access to our medical directors and will also give us support from all over the world um, from medical personnel. Okay, we can go to the next one. There we go. Okay, so we work off of a minimum, better, best model. Um, and within that, we've come up with what the best thing we can present right now with the circumstances. Um, our treatment flowchart is a working document. Every week, our medical team meets and we adjust this as new information comes out. Um, and this is also based on what we can source and what we can feasibly achieve. Um, so again, this is a working document and we are defining COVID symptoms as cough, shortness of breath, GI upset, and fever. Um, mild symptoms are defined as no shortness of breath, able to walk. We're asking them to call the hotline, send a member to the clinic, daily phone checks, um, and we, we provide uh, DC instructions on self-isolation. We will also be doing flu swabs to see um, if they are flu and we are looking at the rates of co-infection and, and how to address that. Moderate symptoms will be defined as shortness of breath, trouble walking, repeated vo uh, vomiting. Uh, we will check their vitals, evaluate whether they need to come in or not. And we will also be doing point of care ultrasound on the lungs to just check the progression there. Um, we're using the butterfly IQ in the field, which has been a great tool for us. Okay, we can go to the next one. Okay, using a compassionate care model um, for severe, severely ill patients. Um, our initial plan is to send them to the hospital and then deploy our field hospital. However, this week the public hospital has closed to the public. Um, so that is a new wrinkle in things. Um, they are open for emergencies only, but the gates are locked and uh, to get in for an emergency is quite an ordeal. So now we are looking at having to be kind of autonomous uh, but our plans are we're looking at antibiotics for co-infections. We are looking at using chloroquine. And again, we are updating this uh, daily and weekly to uh, confirm to, uh, to uh, use best practice. Um, we're doing the basic ulcer prophylaxis, uh, DVT prophylaxis, that kind of stuff. So we're going to try to offer a progressive level of care. We have some real limitations when it comes to oxygen delivery. We're using oxygen concentrators. Uh, we only have one unit that can get up to 10 liters. And at this time, we have no capabilities for ventilation. Although we are trying to get to a point where we can offer ventilation to four patients. So we're working on that now. We also have a palliative care model um, and a supportive care model. We are not able to use narcotics down there, so it's gonna consist of uh, benzos and Tylenol for symptom relief, and we are training spiritual leaders uh, to put on uh, protective gear so they can offer counseling to both the patients and their families uh, through this process. Okay, we can go to the next one. Um, so everything looks good on paper. You know, we've ordered all our supplies. We're about two weeks away from having everything on the Matamora side to be completely uh, self-sufficient. Um, and now we're just reacting to things that happen in real time. I talked about the ventilation capabilities and what we're working on there. Um, we're dealing with the, the closure of the public hospital. And that puts a big question in our minds because does that mean we are now going to have an influx of patients that are not just asylum seekers, but are also citizens of Madame Morris because they don't have anywhere to go. And how is that going to affect us? So on the behind the scenes practical side of things, we are in contact with the mayor's office on both sides of the border daily. We are in contact with the health department daily. We are in contact with the head of the hospital system down there daily. And we are trying to troubleshoot all of this in, in real time and still secure the permissions we need to move forward and educate people on what is happening. The response there has been a little bit um, 
behind the curve. So we're, we're dealing with that. Another thing we're dealing with is the border closure. Right now we have secured permissions from both sides to be personal. We have to look at the possibility of our supply lines being cut off or stolen. We also have cartel considerations. This is a cartel controlled area. We are in a little bit of a um, buffer zone where we have had, haven't had any problems, but um, you know, again, that's one of our considerations. And right now we also don't have any testing capabilities either in the city of Matamoros or in camp, but we are working to secure those. Um, how do we handle deaths? We've made a couple relationships with local mortuaries. And so we have a process for that as well to try to handle that as respectfully and um, as dignified as possible. Um, we also have evacuation plans for our staff if they become ill. We're dealing with exploding costs and going from 20K a month to run the clinic to about 200K a month for the next six months if we have to keep the field hospital open that long. So on top of everything else, we're having to deal with fundraising and social media messaging, all of that too. And then there's just the stress of all of us having to um, wear multiple hats at home. Some of us are, not myself, but uh, some of our staff are in the Army Reserves. And what if they get called up? We all have home hospitals that we work for, et cetera. Um, one thing that was very interesting is I had the opportunity to speak to a researcher at Imperial College in London, Andrea Crisanti, who did the research study in the Italian city of Vaux. And they were able to isolate their people there, do blanket testing for everybody, and stop the progression of the disease. Um, so we looked at applying that VO model to camp if we get quarantined and if that would work. But the reality is we just don't have the testing capabilities, nor can we control the flow of people. Um, OK, we can go to the next one. I wanted to put up some useful resources because our plans did not come up in a vacuum. They came up from they came from various places. MedCram, I think, has been doing an amazing job on their coronavirus series and also their vent refresher. Butterfly IQ has been very supportive of us, and they have a good um, training tool on COVID progression in the lungs. Um, and then vent guidelines, um, how to rig multi-patient uh, vents and uh, safe pre-oxygenation. So those have been great resources for us, and it's been very interesting to work through that. Um, on the next slide, I just have some of our references from where we came up with our treatment algorithm. And again, we are looking at this every day. Um, like everybody else, we are a small team. We're about 10 people working on this full time with our, our jobs at home too. Um, so this information sharing has been very helpful and, and we really appreciate what you guys have done to uh, facilitate that. Well, thank you so much for that. I feel like uh, a I ha I'm when I hear from you and the work that you're doing, I feel like we have a lot of opportunity to actually learn from what you've done, and it gives me a lot of um, hope around what's possible. I had a few questions myself, if 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 uh, you don't mind. One was actually around initially, but you answered around testing. I I. Um, <clears throat> I've heard um, both the Italian experience of really a small community isolating and aggressively testing and also read a very interesting um, article from a Native American community who had said they would use their isolation as their strength. And so I wondered about that possibility for you in terms of influx and, and efflux from the camp, but it sounds like you can you don't you're not really or even the community there is not really in control of who's able to come in or come out and with the public hospital closing that might be even more problematic so is, is testing really the main limitation there or is it you know in coming in and coming out or is there a way that you could try to push on that strategy it's it's both um you know if we were able to secure PCR testing in camp where we could identify those asymptomatic carriers and isolate them, then we might push a little bit more for a camp quarantine or that kind of thing. But um, the only tests we would be able to bring in are the um, antibody assay tests. So we're always going to be three to four days behind the infection. We're never going to get ahead of it. And even just bringing those in um, is a very difficult task and something we've had to balance. Um, we would love to have tests in camp. However, that makes us a target as well if we have something that the broader community doesn't have. So it's not one or the other, it's, it's both things that we're looking at. Yeah, I'm hoping a lot of people have been asking me about rapid diagnostics and it's been quite, the, the ones that I've seen coming available fastest 
have been the antibody um, tests. They're not really rapid diagnostics because obviously the antibody is not positive for a num at least a number of days. But there are, I believe, some antigen antibody um, tests that are in the pipeline. I've been trying to get some more information on who's making them and who's studying them and who's doing quality. But I think um, understanding more of those, that might be an approach if they, be, if they do become available. But maybe one last question before I um, turn it over to others to comment is around, um, let's call it conflict management, that having resources, whatever small resources they may be, can sometimes result in some conflict, whether it's the host community outside or within the micro communities you described. Have you, um, through your experience, either there or in other settings, uh, any advice for those of us who are trying to um, think about how to manage conflict within communities that we are not maybe initially part of? Um, you know, coronavirus is, is, is a unique setting, um, but there are universal messages there. We have always maintained that we will treat anybody who walks into our clinic, and that's how we've uh, we've, we've enjoyed a nice neutrality on the ground. It doesn't matter to us if you're an asylum seeker, a metamora citizen, or even cartel. We treat everybody. We've even treated some of the um, soldiers and government officials from that side too, and their families. Um, so we maintain that neutrality and we've built that reputation. However, we are very mindful um, that um, some of the preconceived notions earlier that this was somehow a an asylum seeker's disease and migrant disease because they don't wash their hands as much or something instead of realizing that it's people who are able to travel, who are able to go to restaurants and cafes who are most likely going to be the vectors. So we did deal with that initially. And what we basically said was, if there are gonna be any riots or protests or violence against the asylum seekers, you guys are just gonna spread the, vi uh, the virus everywhere. You're going to risk your police officers and um, uh, your soldiers as well being exposed. So it's not good for anybody. So we, we've tried to combat that with sensible information. And, um, and like every other government in the world, um, the local government in Matamoros is likely, uh, their resources are likely insufficient to respond to a, a mass pandemic. That's the reality of the situation. So we're still in that, that period of time where there's not enough to do on their side where they're paying a lot of attention to what we do when in about two weeks, it's just gonna be all hands on deck and we're all gonna to have to work together. So we are trying to maintain open lines of communication and uh, positive working relationships. So when that time hits, we can work together um, in a constructive manner, but that's, that's really the best we can do right now. Great, thanks. Um, my last question to you, and then maybe Dr. Walton, can all, Dr. Walton can also comment is um, your, your diagram of your proposed um, healthcare environment when you have cases and you mentioned negative pressure tents. Can you say a little bit more because I think some of our uh, attendees might be interested if that's a thing, are you gonna be yes, constructing I it? Can. can you tell us more about that? You stole, yes, definitely I, stole my question, Louise, but I'll come up with another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have, I'll have to text somebody to get the exact model because I have not been on the ordering and logistics side so much. So I'll get the exact model um, and where we got them from. But basically, we have two tents that can be um, set up within a day. Um, they're being brought in on pallets. And uh, from, from what I understand from the people who are much smarter at engineering than I am, we can set them up within a day and we have uh, 10 different patient separation areas. I even have a diagram of them. So I'm happy to share that with everybody but I will get that specific information for you. Yeah, yeah that would be great. And we can, for, uh, we can post um, a link to that. We will make it available to folks. Um, Dr. Walton, any comment? No, I, I, so uh, wonderful presentation and uh, I'm learning a lot. A, <laughs> a quick question, just back to the testing comment. I think all of us, I mean, a recurring theme in these um, webinars is the question of testing and, and uh, Louise alluded to it a little bit earlier because there, uh, there are so many sort of variants and hardly anyone has access to PCR or very few in these settings. Mm -hmm. And then Andrea, you mentioned the, um, the antibody test. So given that you do have a small sort of circumscribed community of people, is there any thought around sort of utilizing the antibody test as a surveillance tool. And I guess the second question would be, um, what, what, to what degree is the camp porous 
such that even, you know, are people going out into the town and then coming back in? Or is it really, I mean, I know you, you said you haven't quarantined the camp per se, but how much fluidity is there between the camp and the rest of the broader community? Because the way the camp is set up, we have a natural barrier with the river on one side, and then we have fencing that runs between the park and the road. And there's only three gates um, that are entrances and exits from the camp. So we tossed around that idea of can we close it down? Can we get our hands on assay tests? And can we just try to be a contained unit? Um, however, a lot of people in camp work in the city. Um, food is being brought in from outside. So I, I really, uh, I really try to pound out that VO model and, and talking with uh, Dr. Crisante about that to just see if there was any way we could facilitate that in camp. But at this time, um, we can't get the cooperation we need to make that happen. Um, and like I said before, maybe in two weeks when people have their hands full, we'll, we'll be able to uh, be a little bit more creative. And we are certainly working every day to get those assay tests in and use that as a tool. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass the uh, floor to Dr. Punjabi to um, make his comments and then we'll come back to more discussion. And I Thank have a little update. They are Blue Med Express shelters, 20 by 32 feet. So that's where they come from. Blue Med, Blue Med Express. Okay. Thank you. Okay. L Louise, can you hear me? And is there, are the slides coming through? Yes, they are. Great. Andrea, thanks for that. That was um, inspiring. Thank you. And it's actually, we work in remote rural communities in, um, um, in Liberia and other parts of Africa. And uh, th that's given us a lot of insights about what we could be doing as well there. So I was asked by Dr. Ivers, thanks for inviting me to speak about the role of community health workers who we know have been vital in many epidemics. Um, and I've, I've, I've said the title here is rapidly expanding healthcare teams because community health workers only work if they're part of a broader medical team with nurses and doctors. Um, I'm going to start by just sharing uh, some of the experience in Liberia, West Africa, where Last Mile Health was founded and where, um, where I grew up and also have worked for many, many years with my colleagues. Um, but you'll remember that across the border from Liberia in 2013, there was a little boy who fell sick with vomiting, fever, and diarrhea. It turned out um, his he died, and a few weeks later, his um, sisters and mother died. This turned out to be the Ebola epidemic. We had, uh, in a time when minutes mattered, had already lost months, and this virus spread like wildfire across West Africa, a place where the forest is dense, but the health workers are sparse. We had just 51 doctors left after our civil war in 2005 for a country of 4 million people, for instance. Um, and in that time, uh, we were told by uh, um, CDC and others that there could be as many as uh, 1.4 million cases of Ebola in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, uh, and that most of those people would die given the high case fatality rate if nothing more was done. I know this sounds familiar to many people here given the COVID projections. Um, at that time, I remember standing in the rainforest with our colleagues, um, uh, nurses, midwives, community health workers, people like Xavier, who were involved in this, um, uh, Xavier Menden, uh, uh, across the country, who had fear in their eyes because they were worried, as many COVID responders are now, about bringing this virus back to infect their own members of their family. And when Ebola threatened to bring humanity to its knees, it, it was, in fact, uh, frontline workers like like nurses like Savior uh, working in Ebola treatment units in in hospital settings and clinic settings who um, reached out to team up with uh, community health workers like Ruth these are folks who are sixth to 12th grade educated have not had prior medical expertise but can be rapidly trained within a matter of weeks by nurses supervised by them integrated into the healthcare system and try to respond um, to, and, and during the Ebola epidemic, uh, community health workers like Ruth, uh, about thousands of them across Liberia, um, were learned the signs and symptoms of Ebola, uh, teamed up with um, uh, nurses and, and others to um, screen patients in communities, to identify the sick, to bring them into care more quickly. Um, and together, um, it was they who helped um, hunt down the virus. Uh, and stop it in its tracks. 
Um, now, we lost way too many people during that crisis, um, a, as we know, but what we found, and including health workers, and what we found, 8% um, of Liberia's health workers were lost uh, during the epidemic, is that wherever the um, uh, response invested in the people closest to the problem, we were more successful. So that's, that's a lesson one from the crisis in uh, Ebola. Um, and why a community-based strategy was critical. The second comes from the long shadow that uh, these epidemics and pandemics have. Uh, we know that epidemics can have indirect health effects. Um, and in, in West Africa, we saw how much the health system collapsed. And in fact, it's um, been reported in multiple studies that the deaths um, from non-Ebola cases, um, untreated malaria, for instance, um, maternal uh, debts because people weren't getting deliveries in, in hospitals uh, were much higher than even Ebola debts during that time. Um, it, it didn't have to be this way. Uh, in Liberia, we saw a collapse of facility-based deliveries uh, by threefold uh, in the country. But in settings where a community-based strategy was used, pairing nurses with community health workers, ensuring the trust of the community, infection prevention control in clinics and hospitals, setting up separate Ebola treatment units, uh, um, we actually found that it's possible to ensure that mothers and primary healthcare services can continue, of course, with modified protocols such as no touch protocols. Um, but these were not implemented in most parts of the country. However, where they were, you can see that facility-based deliveries and also sick child treatment, uh, Liberia is now doing the majority of its rural care uh, through these frontline providers, um, uh, were not interrupted uh, during that time because of this uh, uh, approach of ensuring modified clinical protocols were, were put forward. So, you know, as we know in epidemics, often prevention is pitted against care. What we found um, is that it's possible to unite prevention with care, and that can save many lives because you can find a way to sustain primary health care services. Um, the third lesson is about what happened after the Ebola epidemic. Uh, the Liberian government showed tremendous leadership under President Sirleaf and now President Wea to stand up a national community health assistant program um, that would reach every corner of the country. This program now has 3,800 providers reaching 80% of the rural population. They've, um, these are about 10% of them are nurses, midwives, and physician assistants, the remaining based in clinics, and the remaining are 90% are community health workers like Ruth out in communities. Um, just in the past uh, few, couple of years, they've, they themselves have identified the first thing they were trained on was surveillance uh, and looking for the 13 uh, uh, public health events of, of concern, such as viral hemorrhagic fevers, measles, um, uh, and they have already identified 4,600 potential epidemic events that get reported up through the clinic and hospital systems. So this has been going on for the past couple of years. And um, uh, you can see that uh, not only has this important for, been for epidemic surveillance and response, but because this platform's now been used to uh, treat um, uh, important causes of mortality like malaria, which, which um, uh, takes at least um, the majority of prevent causes the majority of preventable deaths in our country, um, they're now doing one fifth of um, uh, all cases of uh, con uh, diagnosing and treating all cases of malaria and then referring complicated cases, of course, up. Um, I think the third lesson here then is that the best emergency systems are everyday systems that can surge in a crisis. And as I now pivot to thinking about um, uh, the work that we and a number of peer organizations are doing, thinking about how community-based uh, strategies could be deployed in, in COVID-19, I do want to make a point. Um, it, it is the community health workers are a part of a comprehensive strategy. President Sirleaf and I uh, published last week in Time some of the lessons from, from Ebola and talked about the work that um, is absolutely critical, like standing up Ebola treatment units, oxygen concentrators, ventilators, the kind of work that Andrea is talking about, the kind of work that David and Vanessa do through Build Health and Seed um, around the world. Um, so, we, 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 but it is a vital part. It's, it, um, it does not solve anything on its own, but it is, and it's only as good as the system that it refers into. But it is critical, and I think um, we're seeing how critical it can be already. Um, when you compare and contrast the uh, six, uh, the, the success and failures that various countries are happening in this pandemic. Uh, the South Korean foreign minister the other day noted that um, at, at its peak, South Korea was experiencing almost a thousand uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 a day. 
they're now down to uh, about 100 or a little less than 100 per day. Um, it's been uh, said in the media that testing, 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 widespread testing was critical. Um, the drive-throughs that they did were uh, uh, making uh, testing available as close to home as possible were absolutely critical. Um, but folks like Dr. El Elward, Bruce at, at the World Health Organization, who's helping lead this response globally, are saying shift from where we are today to a place where we can have viral suppression. Uh, it's absolutely going to be critical to test every single case, rapidly isolate cases, ensure, of course, those um, that fall sick get into care. Um, uh, if we're going to avoid or at any point modify these big shutdown measures that are there. So if we're going to be successful here, a community-based strategy is going to be absolutely critical. So how can community health workers play a role, especially in low-resource settings um, around the world? What we've, we've uh, just published this morning in the BMJ, uh, and I've provided the link here, uh, with colleagues from the Community Health Impact Coalition and the Liberian government, um, some, some roles that the Liberian government are either um, training these workers in or, um, or, or considering doing so. And uh, they range from preventions such as ensuring that wash uh, interventions, uh, hand hygiene stations, soap water um, are, are put forward. So many of these communities live without access to clean um, uh, water and, and soap. Um, but they also will play a role in detection um, as rapid diagnostic kits become available, um, that will be uh, critical, and we uh, are working to order some of those. Uh, but in the meantime, sample collection uh, is going to be critical. Liberia already has three confirmed COVID cases, and um, uh, if, if the progression, uh, if it replicates, then we could be seeing as many as 400 cases in the next 30 days uh, with many, many more contacts, and that is the part of response that's critical. You can see community health workers, as they did during the Ebola epidemic, but as they've done in many others, uh, both ensure that those um, with COVID-19 are supported, monitoring them for clinical de deterioration, ensuring they get rapid referral uh, to uh, ensure hospitalization, contact tracing, but also uh, ensuring that routine primary health care services are continued. I want to emphasize this point because we're hearing from others um, that uh, 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 primary health care should be shut down. Um, and, you know, in, in resource-rich settings, it may be um, more possible to do virtual telemedicine consults. Um, telemedicine is not available in most parts of these settings. When you say shut down primary health care services, uh, the kind of excess mortality that we saw in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia during uh, uh, Ebola, I fear, would be uh, what we're condemning most people to. So we have to keep health workers safe, but we should be working now, um, we think, to, to support ministries of health, health and healthcare systems in low resource settings to come up with modified protocols that can work in clinic and facility and community levels to ensure that vaccines, uh, integrated community case management, all of that uh, can be continued while workers are kept safe with the right uh, PPE, as well as um, uh, protocols that allow, allow primary health care to go. Um, one of the things we're experimenting with, and I'll offer this as a resource to everybody, um, is, is leveraging Liberia's digital training platform, which is, uh, is going to be scaled elsewhere. Um, it's going to be very hard to train community health workers in batches of hundreds, which is where they're usually trained when you have social distancing protocols, as they already do in Liberia, uh, to have uh, n meetings of no, less, uh, no more than 10 people. Um, so um, the science is also evolving, uh, the roles of community and frontline health workers, um, the treatments that may come forward, such as post-exposure post prophylaxis or vaccines eventually, um, all of that is going to, and treatments, that's all going to evolve. So um, we are trying to see if this uh, training platform called the Community Health Academy, uh, which is open source, any government, any health system, any NGO can write on it. Um, happy to provide the links at communityhealthacademy.org. Can be useful here. Um, we're hoping to stand up a global classroom uh, where anyone can download online and mobile content, curating what's already out there, but also providing uh, perhaps new uh, uh, content as it, as it comes up. So if that's useful to anybody or you want to contribute to your training content, we'd, we'd love to speak with you. Um, let me la say uh, with the last couple moments I have is that this is not a lower standard of care. It is a higher standard. In fact, it could be more relevant or just as relevant in resource-rich settings, such as uh, the United Kingdom, where our, our colleagues, uh, Sir Andy Haynes and colleagues just called this week in the Lancet for a national program of community health workers. Um, uh, and in the United States, colleagues at University of Pennsylvania, here in Massachusetts, I've been in touch with Monica Burrell, 
um, uh, there is a role for these workers to play at the very least in providing social care and dealing with the economic fallout. Three million worker, th workers lost their jobs this week, uh, filed unemployment claims in the United States. Uh, the United States only has 50,000 community health workers. Uh, by global standards, they should have at least 500,000. Uh, and so at least 500,000 more could be hired with some of the money coming from the federal government, perhaps, um, and, and philanthropy um, in these settings. Um, this has to be done right. Uh, community health workers are the most undervalued, underrecognized part of the health workforce in India. Just this past week, it was reported that their nearly million strong ASHA workforce were going around without masks or hand sanitizers. Um, uh, this is unacceptable. Um, and uh, we know it builds on the back of a long inequity for community health workers. The poorest women uh, of whom um, community health workers are primarily women around the world, uh, in the world, actually subsidize healthcare with their unpaid work to the tune of a trillion dollars, a figure that's larger than economies of over 150 countries. Most community health workers in the world don't get paid or fairly paid. So it's, it's not surprising to us that um, they would be asked to go sacrifice themselves on the front lines, but it's absolutely unacceptable that they're not protected. So um, uh, a number of organizations uh, uh, have bought, uh, come together to issue guidance on this um, uh, at communityhealthimpact.org. And it starts with ensuring that uh, PPE is produced not just for some health workers, but all health workers, including community health workers, um, and, uh, and that these workers have, uh, are part of uh, uh, the essential health workforce in this setting. So these are some of the, the actions that uh, we collectively are recommending for any of you who are involved in trying to stand up these workforces in your settings. Uh, I'll end with uh, the words from our colleague in Ethiopia, Abraham Zerihun. Uh, who says that the coronavirus crisis is sounding the alarm that if we are to survive, we need to step up to close the glaring health gaps between the global north and the global south. Health for all is no longer just a moral obligation, uh, but a prerequisite for survival for all. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Punjabi. Really appreciate that. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions and then I want to ask Dr. Carey also to comment in terms of health systems and we've had been having some conversations about, about those. Just to be really pragmatic, um, digital training needs Wi-Fi or bandwidth or cellular service. Do Are you supporting community health workers in that way? What's your... Um, what's the way that we can make sure that people actually have access to the training? I Because I, certainly one of the questions we had was like, how do we train community health workers when we can't gather? And then um, some one of the um, attendees is just saying they'd love to uh, work with some of this material, make it available in Spanish. I'm, I'm really interested to know if the Community Health Academy has other languages uh, available. I'm sure folks would like to hear that. And then, you know, also very pragmatic is the PPE, because I think the, you know, we, we, we absolutely have to make sure that we don't sacrifice, as you said, frontline health workers, especially community members, uh, as you said, oft, very often women without the appropriate protective materials. And so have you been working on that at a kind of high level policy area, especially with your own reputation in the community health field? I'd love to hear more because I think the question we're being asked every single week and we have more questions than that today, is how do we manage when we don't have enough PPE? And I fear that the community health workers will be um, kind of the first in line. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those. So um, I'll answer those quickly and then if they're follow-ons. Um, so on digital training, indeed, actually, the, the um, you know, most community health workers in the world are offline. And so the app um, that's been created with our colleagues at Digital Campus um, and actually used by midwives and nurses in many parts of the world has been, we've modified it to work for offline settings. And in fact, the 3,800 providers in Liberia already have content, they've had it uh, on malaria, malnutrition, et cetera. Um, supervisors download it in online settings and then they transfer it through Bluetooth to offline settings. Um, so that is possible, it's easier in urban settings, but in fact, um, that's where this disease is gonna spread first as we've already seen. and so. Um, that's going to make it easier to transfer um, uh, data. So happy to talk offline with anyone who wants to um, uh, uh, deploy this again. Could work for any kind of health worker that this uh, could be useful. Um, the, the, the second question um, was around, uh, sorry, Louise, repeat the second question again. Um, around 
language. Um, oh, language, yeah. Is, so, uh, so, yeah, so the Academy is a partnership effort and uh, Translators Without Borders uh, and our colleagues at Medical Aid Films, Core Group, uh, and a few others are actually going to be um, uh, putting in, uh, be committed to translating this. So if you have requests for those, we would like to hear them because then in Spanish I heard already, we'd like to be able to help uh, push that. Of course, one of the pressures we're facing is that this all came together in the last week while we've had the Academy standing. Um, the idea of a COVID content uh, is gonna, um, we're trying to do this in days, not weeks, and put out at least some bite-sized animated content that could be um, uh, true, but be culturally adaptable and context, social economic context, adaptable animated content we found as a little easier to adapt uh, to language. So. Um, but again, we also want content from folks. Uh, we might pull in, Andrea, some of your content that you shared already, um, uh, but even how to wear a mask, any of those things are critical. The last point about PPE. Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, huge. I, I don't want the message to be that prioritize community health workers over nurses, uh, hospital doctors. I, I think we're uh, powerful enough as, as uh, the private sector, public sector, et cetera, to create enough PPE for all. Our, our, so, um, uh, what we're doing is is recognizing the reality that some countries don't have this already and may not for some time, but it um, uh, and so we're 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 designing protocols that work for both uh, areas where you have no or shortage of PPE, and then what you could do and what would the tasks be of the worker when you do have PPE. So you avoid the kind of situations in India where you know you're just saying go door to door for case finding when they haven't been given PPE first. So um, in terms of policy advocacy, I think this is critical. We've been in touch with um, David Nabarro and Tedros's team. I think one of the big challenges is just ensuring that these, uh, the quantification is done um, and that these are, they're included at least in the demand forecast. So as you get companies around the world seconded to provide uh, PPE. I have. I. I actually don't have a doubt that at some point in this crisis, surplus is going to get created, as we've already seen in China, where Jack Ma is providing PPE for the Ethiopian government. Um, but it won't be surplus that covers community health workers unless we demand it, and so that's and and show people how much it's going to take to get there. So I, I think that we could use help on as well for many of you who are, have quantification exercises already done for other kinds of workers. Uh, we've built a few of our own models uh, and we're gonna be on a call with Direct Relief, uh, a medical supplier later today to see if we can get some of this PPE in for, for community health workers. Thanks Raj. Um, Dr. Carey, I just want to bring you in. Thanks for joining us to discuss a little bit about um, the health system context um, and how the community health workers fit in with that. And then we have 10 more minutes left and after that, I want to go back to David Walton because we have a few more questions about PPE um, and I wanted to pose them to him. I, I'm, I'm not going to say much long other than just to thank everybody for, um, I think, these really important comments. And I think both in the context of conflict and fragile settings as well, or where there's complex politics, um, as well as the role that we can, you know, how do you, what we're ultimately talking about is how do we create a comprehensive healthcare system that can not only you know, address the surge of what's happening with COVID, but can also maintain the essential services because as we always are saying, babies are still gonna be born, people are still gonna have hypertensive crises, heart attacks, especially with the increased stress that we're living in in today's world. These other issues are ongoing. And if there is an opportunity in COVID, it is that it has really opened um, and illustrated the profound inequities of health systems around the world and even within our own communities um, of how you can deliver services. For example, you know, um, you know what, what the politics are of a community can very much determine who feels safe to get care or not. And so um, I think it's terrific that this uh, this seminar has been able to really sort of explore some of these issues. And it, I think that just to highlight that as we, we think about how we're gonna provide services, um, it's, you know, and the question I'd actually had for Raj too is, you know, the, the role of the community health worker is clearly so critical and can make a big um, support for, when you think about accessing, the ability to scale up testing, surveillance, and all these pieces is very important. Excuse me a second. That's beautiful, sweetie. Thank you. Um, I see they have this weird magnet for my webinar time. It's amazing um, that there's a lovely manicure happening on the non-COVID world. Um, so 
it's simply to say that, you know, we think about the, how are we going to, the needs right now are immense. We need to be able to, the only way, because of the pattern of COVID being infectious before you show signs of symptoms, very aggressive case identification, tracing, quarantine, and then the support services that need to go into place when that happens is going to be mission critical for stopping this. COVID is in our lives in a meaningful way until there's a vaccine and we can start to really create the kind of immunity we need against it, which means that our ability to identify the pockets and shut them down is going to be critical if we have any hope of living our lives with some sense of normal. Um, and community health workers can play a critical role in that, but you have to do it in a responsible and protective way. So PPE was my big question of how do you ensure that you're protecting these people? And as we think about the inequities in our healthcare systems right now, it isn't just in terms of the delivery of services, right? It's also who's at risk of getting COVID. And this is the people who have to go to work, the hourly workers. The surge of cases in Boston right now, at least at Mass General, are primarily coming out of Chelsea and East Boston, not surprisingly because there's higher density. These are folks that don't have access to services. I'm confident there's cultural barriers to people getting the information they need to understand how to protect themselves um, and a lot more reliance on the need to, you know, not, not the same ability to shelter in place. And so you do have to think about what do support services look like in addition, and that's part of health, right? It's, it's, it's supporting the social determinants of health in this. And there's a critical role for community health workers certainly to play that role in America, in England, as well as in our partner countries um, around the world. And so, and I think that the idea that Raj raised um, of how do we enlist those that are now unemployed is gonna be really important because there is an extraordinary opportunity to solve multiple problems at once if we're creative and we're smart and we push for it. But this is the job that's incumbent on all of us is to say, you know, we sit in this position of straddling knowledge, policy, um, and really understanding the complexity of care delivery. And it's going to be incumbent on all of us to think about how do we engage these policymakers and inform them with the information they need um, to be able to do the right thing, make the right decisions, and have a win win solution. Um, but I do want to leave time for David because I know there's a lot. I think the key to this is going to be the equipment and the tools that we put in place because I think we can mobilize the people, the training, and the rest. But you can't mobilize a team to do aggressive case testing if we don't have a place to isolate people and we don't have the test we need. Yeah, I think for, you know, we have so many questions about testing every every week, I think. Um, and, and for example, we received a question about um, antibody. If you're IgG positive, does that mean that you're not infectious? Unfortunately, the antibody is really only telling you about exposure. And the IgG is telling you that the exposure was a little more distant, but it really tells us nothing about infectiousness. I think we're still trying to properly understand the duration of infectiousness. Um, so I think if you're IgG positive and you had symptoms two or three or four weeks ago and don't have symptoms now, you're probably not infectious, but the antibody test alone doesn't um, tell you that. And it seems to me that so many of the things we're talking about, whether it's in the camp in Matamoros, whether it's the community health workers going to a house, whether it's the health system and the pregnant lady, who doesn't have any respiratory symptoms is all so predicated on having a test available to know if an asymptomatic person is actually infected. Um, that will be just such, I think, a, a game changer when we can really, really scale that up. David, the, can you give us, you know, for the last five minutes maybe an update? And if, if folks have questions, please keep them coming in um, in the in the QA. What's the latest on the safe? You know that we're now reusing N95s in a way we didn't used to do it. There is now more use of surgical masks. Can you yeah. tell us what's the most recent in the Boston hospitals and what you know about other places for PP? Sure. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ivor. Sorry, I was using first names because you're all of my friends, but I should, you know, maintain our professionalism here. I apologize. So. A couple things. One is, uh, in addition to thinking about all of these issues with all of you and those of you who are listening, I also spend my time at one of the Boston hospitals, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, as a clinician, and so I've been on the COVID unit. And in the Boston hospitals, uh, both Massachusetts General Hospital and the Brigham and others, we are having PPE shortages. And so what does that look like for us, which is probably significantly better than it looks like for some of you who might be listening who have no access to PPE. But essentially right now, many of us are 
essentially reusing our face shields or eye protection. Um, all, and we keep it all day and we uh, tend to throw it away at the end of every day, but that may be changing as we continue to exhaust our supplies. And we use an N95. We're required to use an N95 on our COVID unit, which I'll talk about in a second, maybe isn't necessary. And we use that same mask all day. And I mean, I, you know, I, I, I worry as a clinician about the potential nosocomial infection risk of reusing equipment. Again, understanding the privilege of the fact that I even have PPE to utilize. But you know, the biggest danger, as we know from Ebola, is in the doffing, right? And you're, you're, because you've been, you have as allegedly clean PPE, you go in, you get exposed, some of that infectious material, whether droplet or doffing. Um, and so we're donning and doffing and donning and doffing and donning and doffing, reusing. And again, I think when you look at um, the sort of nosocomial infection rate some, in some of our US hospitals, I think we're just now learning about it, but it's not zero. And you look at some of the Chinese hospitals and some of the Italy or sort of providers in Italy as well, and they're using PPE that is sort of full Tyvek suit and goggles and two pair of gloves. And in fact, I think once China sort of switched to this full PPE model, very significant PPE, um, they had zero nosocomial infections from patient to physician or clinician, um, which is an interesting lesson. Again, that's something that we don't have access to. But I do worry about that. And I think, again, there's been some questions that I can see around sort of DIY PPE. And I would potentially refer you to the previous week session where I discussed that in detail. And I don't have time to discuss that in detail today, but there are pretty pragmatic recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control around DIY uh, in terms of eye protection, as well as gowns and face protection including to the extent of using scarves or bandanas when, uh, to sort of protect your oral mucosa um, if you don't have masks. Uh, if, uh, for eye protection, sort of trying to, obviously eyeglasses don't have the side protection, so that's a risk, but using either sort of DIY face shields or things of that nature that can protect your uh, conjunctiva from uh, exposure. And then in addition to that, in terms of gowns, they were talking about lab, lab coats and patient gowns and things of that nature. And so there's a lot of flexibility. I would refer you to the CDC guidelines. There's also a position paper from 2007 that I spoke about last week as well around the reuse of PPE. Again, we all, and specifically in epidemic or pandemic settings, uh, we all understand that that is suboptimal at best and that does provide an additional risk to providers. Uh, but again, we are in a situation where that is unprecedented and we have global shortages. And so, you know, I think this is an occasion for us to really, I mean, I, I share in Raj, uh, Dr. Punjabi's enthusiasm around the fact that we will eventually have a surplus. But right now, you know, there's a, recurrent questions every week about not having any PPE and in fact, us having shortages here. So I think in the meantime, as we plan for having an ideal situation, the, the, having a pragmatic approach around DIY, if you need to do that and or reuse, is really critical to the extent that we can protect our providers because, you know, as you see in the situation in Italy, they're recruiting gynecologists and pathologists and radiologists to treat their patients because they are out of the typical frontline providers because they're either been exposed and symptomatic and or truly uh, positive with COVID and need to be furloughed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know Andrea spoke about your approach of having a minimal, better and best approach. And I think we, um, we're we each day trying to keep our eyes closely on what's the minimal that we could reasonably expect health workers to take on before we put them on the front lines or and as many of us on the line are and I know um, the attendees are. Thank you everyone so much who joined us again today. We had over 80 people joining, so I think we're gonna continue. Uh, we're planning another session next Friday. Um, we hope some of our colleagues from the Middle East are gonna be able to join us for a special seminar about issues there. If you have questions, um, email Kerry Phelan, whose email address is there on the slide. She can help follow up if you didn't catch something, if you want to get some more information. We're going to post this on our website, globalhealth.massgeneral.org. And there's our Twitter um, handles if you want to follow us. That's how a lot of us are sharing information. So I want to really thank our speakers. 
thank the panelists and discussants and thank all of you for joining us. Um, wishing you all to stay well and um, thanks for all that you guys are doing. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much.